All right. Well, welcome everyone. I'm Anna Maria Carnes from the African Studies Program. And this is our Critical Research on Africa lecture series. And we are super Boy. excited to um, have Dr. Chapitalane here with us. And um, just to let you know a little bit about African Studies, we have a certificate program and we do tons of events and scholarship opportunities and study abroad and usually. <laughs> so please uh, check us out and we would love to get in touch with you. Drew is gonna put a link in the chat if you guys would like um, to be on our email list and get more information about our upcoming events. He's also gonna put our website in there too so you can um, check out the, the upcoming events for this semester. The Critical Research on Africa um, conference is coming up in May. And so if you guys have um, some research that you're working on, please uh, go ahead and submit your proposal. Proposals are due at the end of March. So we would love for you guys to submit those and, and Drew will be putting that in the chat. Drew, wave to everybody. This is our admin assistant for African studies. Um, but anyway, welcome. We're really excited about this. I'm gonna pass it off to Dr. Webble to introduce the speaker. Thanks so much, Anna Maria, and thanks to Anna Maria and Drew and, um, and Dr. Macrina Lille, um, who's the Director of African Studies, for allowing us to have a forum for, um, for this wonderful new research from, um, from Robin Chapdelaine from Duquesne. Um, so I'm Mary Wabel. I'm a historian in of African history, and I also work on health in the history department at Pitt, um, and I have helped to coordinate the Critical Research on Africa series um, for the last couple of years. So we are bringing Robin um, back from a COVID cancellation from last spring and we're really thrilled that uh, she's here. So I will take a couple of moments to just introduce Robin and then give you a sense of our time and pacing for the next, um, the next little while and then we'll be off to the races with Robin's talk. So, um, so Dr. Robin P. Chapdelaine is an assistant professor of women's and gender history and African history at Duquesne University. Um, she has a research focus on gender, human trafficking, child labor, and human rights, broadly understood. Um, in addition to her new book, which we are really thrilled to be showcasing today, um, the book is called The Persistence of Slavery, an Economic History of Child Trafficking in Nigeria, published in 2021. Um, Robin has also published articles in African Economic History and the Bull Bulletin of Ecumenical Theology, and she has a forthcoming article in the Journal of West African History. Um, in addition to her monograph and to those, um, those journal articles, she's published a chapter in the book Children on the Move, Past and Present Experiences of Migration, and has forthcoming chapters uh, in um, a book called A Cultural History of Slavery and Human Trafficking in the Age of Global Conflict, and another called Human Trafficking, Global History and Global Perspectives. So uh, it would not be an overstatement to say that Robin is an extremely productive scholar who is doing really cutting edge work at the, at the forefront of modern concerns about migration. And we're really thrilled to have her here to offer some perspective um, and historical perspective on, um, on mobility in Nigeria and, um, and slavery in Nigeria. Um, Robin will have the floor now for the next half hour or so and we'll offer her talk. And then um, after that, I, I will facilitate discussion. So please keep track of your questions. Um, you're, you're free to, to post them into the chat so that we can sort of keep, uh, keep an eye on them. But we will otherwise um, run Q&A by having you raise a hand with the hand raising function in Zoom. Um, and then I will uh, try to manage everybody as they, as they pop up. So thanks very much. And we'll virtually welcome Robin with a, with a clapping of hands. Um, thank you so much, Robin. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Let me take care of these details first so that I can share my screen um, and make sure you all are looking at what I am looking at. And then that would just make this go a little more smoothly. Okay, y'all see it? Excellent. Mm -hmm. um, so good afternoon, it is great to be here. I'd like to extend my appreciation to Dr. Wabel and to the African Studies Program for inviting me here to discuss my book, The Persistence of Slavery and Economic History of Child Trafficking in Nigeria. To start, I wanna show you maps of the study region. So we have um, a map of Af Africa here indicating the general region of the earth that I I am researching, but more specifically, um, a region in West Africa 
um, that was colonized by the British. And in the map on the right, you can see the specific colonized provinces named Calabar, Ogoja, Onitsha, and Oweri. Um, I'll give you an outline of my talk, which will briefly cover the um, table of contents. I'll share with you a short vignette about a young girl who was kidnapped. Um, I'd like to share with you the inspiration for the book where all of this started, as well as global concerns regarding child trafficking during the 1920s. I'll also give an offer, or rather offer a review of the sources that I use, there's a, a variety, and what I discovered in reviewing those sources. Um, and finally, I'll discuss why the findings are significant. So in terms of the table of contents, um, as the chapter outline shows, the first half of the book maps the social conditions in the Bight of Biafra before the onset, onset of formal colonial rule. It outlines how colonial policies reshaped labor systems and money lending practices, and also highlights how an international dialogue about children's welfare came to be the driving force that demanded child trafficking investigations in Nigeria during the 1920s and the 1930s. The final chapters on the women's war in the subsequent decade showcase the prevailing economic conditions, the increased need for loans through the institution of pawnship and the prevalence of other forms of child trafficking. As the slide shows, a man by the name of Inwigwe stole a young girl in 1926. Inigwe's trial occurred almost three years after the alleged offense. He stood accused of participating in the kidnapping of a 12-year-old named Ihoma in the province of Oweri, located in southeastern Nigeria. Ihoma testified that a man named Mbakwe took her from her home and delivered her to an Igwe and his friend. Traveling by canoe, they went up to Umukora, where he consulted with two other people in the privacy of their house about what to do with the girl. At the end of the meeting, Inigwe concealed the girl under a mosquito net as they left the house. He then took her to the bush, a forested area, and kept her there until it got dark. They waited for yet another person to meet with him to discuss the fate of the girl. Scared, Ihoma began to cry, but Inigwe forcefully covered her mouth with his hand and told her that if she made any noise, a policeman would shoot and kill them both. Eventually, through the efforts of Ihoma's brother, she returned home. Unfortunately, we don't have those details, but she was lucky to have his assistance. Ihoma's story is unique, but not because she was kidnapped. She was one of the lucky children who returned to her family after being stolen. Otherwise, her story is an example of a common experience shared by many children throughout southeastern Nigeria during the 1920s and 30s. Ihoma's account illustrates that child dealing practices often involved several people. It included various modes of transportation, and constant efforts to evade police detection. The persistence of slavery details the social, economic, and political environment that created the conditions wherein child trafficking, defined in a variety of ways, became commonplace during the 1920s and 1930s. So the inspiration for the book. Um, the inspiration from the book came from my reading of Judith Van Allen's article. And if I'm not mistaken, Dr. Tema Kaplan's with us and she was uh, one of the individuals that introduced me to this particular article. Um, this article documented a woman's uprising in the Southeast during the last months of 1929. Nigerian women dressed in fern leaves, smeared their bodies with clay, sang and danced at the homes of their respective chiefs and demanded that their grievances be heard. Van Allen argued that women's loss of political autonomy and power resulted in women performing the aforementioned actions known as sitting on a man. 
Quite frankly, after reading this article, I wanted to know more about the African women's movement that gained international attention. As you can see from these New York Times articles, you have attention drawn to an event on December 20th where British police were called to action and where 43 women and at least one man had died. And then a few days later, the call for additional British police officers to assist with the uprising. But that doesn't tell the whole story. Why did women revolt? What was the uprising about? The answer is not so simple. So let us move to a discussion about global concerns about child trafficking during the 1920s at large. Humanitarians and social activists became increasingly involved with the League of Nations committees in its efforts to end slavery and improve global working conditions for women and children generally. In particular, a number of British women joined the committees, Eleanor Rathbone, feminist social reformer, independent mem member of the British parliament and an active member of the Women's International Organizations served as an advisor to the Child Welfare Committee in 1926. In the same year, Julia Lathrop, former chief of the Children's Bureau, advocated that the child has a right to grow normally and harmoniously into the full development of his mental and moral and physical powers. The programs that followed would be part of a larger social welfare effort to address workplace conditions and child trafficking. In 1928, Margaret Ada Benny, a research staff member of the National Industrial Conference Board of the United States, led an investigation into the labor conditions of women and children. Later in 1929, Rathbone, Duchess, Duchess Catherine Madgerie, a British noblewoman who served as the Scottish Unionist Party Member of Parliament, and humanitarian Josiah Wedgwood formed the Committee for the Protection of Colored Women in the Crown Colonies. With eight additional members, this committee focused on clitoridectomy and bride price practices throughout the colonies. These individuals and like-minded supporters persuaded the League members to take a more activist position in improving the livelihoods of women and children throughout the world. At the behest of the women in the League of Nations and owing to growing concerns about pawning and child marriage, the then Governor General Hugh Clifford ordered all district officers in Nigeria to respond to questionnaires detailing native laws and customs in the Southeast. Consequently, the Colonial Office spearheaded investigations into marriage arrangements they deemed illegitimate. It is evident that as a result of the strained economy, child marriage agreements became part of a shadow economy of social exchanges, which brought the institutions of child pawning and slavery even closer to the institution of marriage. Therefore, it was not without cause that investigators primarily focused on child pawning. The government sought information about pawnship, especially with regards to sex, age, consent, and financial agreements between the parents and guard guardians. In addition, Officials wanted to know what, if anything, differentiated pawns from slaves. In 1923, colonial administrators sent out questionnaires asking the district officers, and I quote, to the extent to which pawning, the pawning of children as security for debt still existed in their division, openly or secretly, the position and terms which apply to pawns, the attitude adopted by the native courts, where cases come to light, whether one or both parents held the right to pawn to, uh, according to old custom or whether they both had a consent, whether pawning of adults was common and whether the practice still existed. The status of a pawn, for example, how long the pawn was held, how they were treated, whether it be a female, if she could be given in marriage, and the dowry used to liquidate the debt, or could she be taken as a wife by the pawnee? Other questions included whether the pawn invariably had to live in the house of the person to whom pawned, 
and how it affected his or her social and political status. Should a pawn run away, what was the penalty or result? Whether services rendered by a pawn extinguished any interest on the original debt and whether the principal only was paid back. Whether the customs differed with regard to male or female pawns. And finally, whether a man or woman could pawn him or herself and what the result would be in terms of social and political aspects, end quote. In conducting this questionnaire, residents instruct, instructed rather district officers to enlist the assistance of native rulers to end the practice and to make sure that those who failed to comply suffered punishment. This would not be easily achieved considering the testimony given with regard to the 1929 Women's War. So what did I find in terms of evidence? Generally, information about the Women's War in the late 1920s and 30s came from the testimony I think she may have accidentally removed herself. So we'll just give her a second to get back in. One moment, please. Thanks for your patience, everyone. So. As expected, there's some kind of glitch that has occurred, unfortunately, but hopefully if Drew, you can give me um, host sharing again, I can reshare my. Sure thing, no problem, it happens. I'm glad I didn't lose you all. I thought for a second, which happens sometimes that my entire, my uh, computer shut down, um, but it didn't, so that's good. We've got you. Okay, so here we go again. I'm just going to get you back to the slide that I was at. Okay, I think we are good. Excellent. Okay. So, in addition to the Women's War testimony, we have oral histories that were commissioned in the Southeast, we have colonial documents, we have economic and financial records international correspondence, anthropological reports, in addition to um, other forms of sources. But with specific regard to the 1930 uh, inquiry about the 1929 Women's War, um, we see that Southeastern Nigeria erupted into a violent insurrection led by thousands of militant women the event so challenged assumptions about African women's lack of political sophistication that for the past 50 years, scholars have been investigating the deep-seated causes of what Igbo women entitled the Ogu Umun Wanyin, the Women's War, and what others erroneously called the Abba Riot. Some women and gender scholars have theorized that the Women's War was a feminist movement spurred by the construction of a feminist consciousness. However, T. Obikaram Echua, the author of the novel, I Saw, the Sky, I Saw the Sky Catch Fire, and grandson of a woman who lived in the Southeast when the women's war occurred, told a different story when I interviewed him. He said it was not uncommon to hear the women of its household and throughout the community detail the events of the war in casual conversation. The war itself was a time marker. He also noted that the, development, that the development of feminist studies and conversations with his daughter served as two significant factors that led Dr. Obi to write the novel. He claimed that by the late 1980s, he had observed feminism creating artificialities and false categories for African women. With what seemed like sheer annoyance he proclaimed the vagina, the vagina monologues ain't nothing, just sheer bodiness. 
compared to the Igbo crotch dance. He spoke about the importance of motherhood and how women perform the crotch dance in groups, raising their arms, swinging them down, slapping their crotches. This birth ceremony, even if seemingly body, had spiritual and social importance. He recounted that women became even more body with age. And even those depicted in historical accounts of the women's war are said to have flaunted their naked bodies and rubbed up against the leaders they were protesting. He conceded he had never heard of Judith Van Allen or others involved in the academic debate about the women's war, but claimed whatever it meant to be a feminist in the United States, feminism had nothing to do with the women's war in Nigeria. He exclaimed that Igbo women went to war. This was an actual war, not an intellectual debate. He went on to explain that, quote, the women had had enough, and like an earthquake, they linked themselves to the spiritual and they heaved. The ripple effect of the uprising shook all that existed in the colonial order, end quote. Fortunately, we have access to the voices of those women who gave eloquent testimony in the commission summer, summoned to examine the war. In reading the testimonies, it is immediately evident that the personal accounts provided during the hearings underscore the reality that women from all major ethnic groups in southern, southeastern Nigeria experienced economic hardships amid the political disorder unleashed by colonial policies in the first two decades of the 20th century. At the top of their list of complaints was their suffering at the hands of the corrupt, corrupt warrant chief system and the economic crisis of 1929, which we all know as the Great Depre Depression. By the conclusion of the inquiry in 1930, it was evident that women rose up against the warrant chiefs, court clerks, court messengers, tax collectors, and those who defrauded them in their trade dealings, causing the erosion of their wealth and political status in society. To be clear, numerous Nigerian women operated as traders and the increased import prices, decreased export prices, and the rumored threat of taxation of women proved to be too much. One of the most salient examples comes from the testimony given by a woman named Nwachi, who expressed that should women be taxed in addition to men and boys that they, quote, would have no children left, end quote. She explained that her people, the impoverished and guru, had to borrow money to pay taxes lest they be subject to imprisonment and further abuse by warrant chiefs. Noting the distinct continuities between the end of the transatlantic trade and the contemporary conditions under British rule, Nwachi lamented, quote, in the old days, there were tribal fights and men carried on slave dealing. But since the advent of the government, meaning the British colonial government, people have sometimes gone to bed and their children have been stolen, stolen owing, owing to poverty. We want to make a report about the children who were stolen. We make reports to chiefs, but if it is a girl who is stolen, it takes nearly all of the money that would have been paid for her dowry to trace her. If your child is stolen in the first place, the chief would make no effort to get her back. And if the parents found out where the child was and the culprits were arrested, they would pay money to the chiefs not to punish them. And in the end, there would be no justice at all. The chiefs are always harsh on us, end quote. This statement clearly illustrates the link between the local and colonial economies and the resulting consequences for children. Another testified to the following. We were paying three shillings or three dollars in modern language. Money was hard to get. Somebody who has no such money will have worked for four pence a day and paying three shillings a year. If people don't pay tax, they will harass him. Someone who is poor will now pawn the child. They were seeing the court messenger as the colonial master. 
he will use his staff and yell, stop, stop, stop. If you don't pay the tax, they will beat you like a beast. Then someone who was poor would run to his neighbor and ask him to lend him three shillings to avoid them coming to his compound or destroying his belongings. The court class will come to your house and make an announcement. All of the villagers will assemble at the square. The clerk will come and talk to them. The chiefs and the servants will also be there. And then there'll be a roll call. Roll call. Those who did not pay, they will carry the person to the court in Abba. When the clerk finishes the job in that community, the community will contribute yams to that clerk. The community will also give him a goat. Then they will select people from the community to carry the yams to his own town. People will be selected to carry these goods and yams to his house. You don't doubt the clerk because he can send you to jail. Then the warrant chief would give an order that nobody could challenge him. He will just say he will send you to prison." End quote. Thus, avoiding penalties and public humiliation created a communal response in some instances where fellow villagers helped relieve the debtor's burden. On other occasions, some could not evade the tax collectors. They had to find a way of securing the funds. The fear of public prosecution was enough to provoke increasing numbers of people to seek out loans. Evidence shows that those who could not secure a loan from a friend or family member would approach a known money lender and suffer the egregious interest rates. Here we understand that the prevailing economic environment of the Great Depression and that of the British policies, including taxation upon men, necessitated Nigerian families to pawn their children in order to pay colonial taxes. So in terms of child pawning, pawning was a method by which individuals leveraged labor and secured access to loans. Pawnship was a form of legal dependency in which a pawn was held as security, became a widespread labor condition in various parts of Africa during the 20th century. The pawn's labor paid the interest on the debt until the debtor reimbursed the money lender. Southeastern Nigerians utilized the institution of pawnship as the main way to guarantee loans during the economic stress caused by colonial policies. And through this method, hundreds, if not thousands of Southeastern Nigerian children were thrust into domestic slavery. And in the case of girl pawns, some were married off at a young age. The process of offering a girl or young woman in marriage or as a pawn, processes that separated her from her natal village, might suggest the parents lacked an emotional connection with their child. But it is imperative to recognize that the child's intrinsic value was deeply embedded in both the domestic sphere as it related to her identity and marriage, as well as the economic potential she engendered once married or offered as a pawn. Pawning a female child often led to the marriage of the child to the money lender or to one of his or her family members. In this case, the money lender canceled the loan as it would then be used as the bride price payment. In other instances, strangers as well as relatives participated in the outright seizure and sale of children to obtain money. Children taken under these circumstances rarely returned home. Though colonial officials successfully prosecuted more individuals for the outright sale of children than for pawning, the vulnerability of children was gendered. Child dealers of female children often claimed that they had paid the bride price according to custom, making it virtually impossible to prosecute them. So how was it that children became slaves in light of being pawned and what did colonial authorities do about it? Colonial authorities may not have been able to distinguish pawned persons from slaves because they often performed similar duties. A child could imperceptibly pass from one status to another unbeknownst to the British. Even so, there was a real 
and meaningful distinction between the two statuses. Masters owned slaves, whereas credit, creditors controlled the pawn's labor, owing to the pawning contract. Pawns enjoyed limited rights and privileges, mainly the right of redemption, and that is key. And they could seek legal intervention if they were mistreated or if a dispute arose about the loan. Slaves did not have the same recourse. Therefore, in instances where a child passed through four or five sets of hands, it was likely that the child would end up in some form of slavery, either as a slave wife, a slave laborer, or a slave for religious rituals. Despite the numerous available archival resources, it has been impossible to quantify the exact number of pawning cases that's transformed that transformed into child marriage or slavery during this period. Still, we do get a glimpse of child pawnship slavery and child marriage through anecdotal evidence and by analyzing the available case studies found in court records, oral histories, and in other arch archival materials. So what I argue is that the persistence of child slavery and various forms of child trafficking can be understood only when children and their labor are evaluated within local and global socioeconomic conditions. Despite either, rather despite earlier abolition, abolitionist attempts to end slavery, access to children's bodies represented monetary wealth and social security. Domestically enslaved children exemplified the new face of slavery in the early 20th century and beyond. This new form of slavery, alongside quote unquote legitimate commerce in Africa, has not received sufficient attention, unlike that of earlier forms of slavery, mainly chattel slavery associated with the transatlantic slave trade. In this book, I show how a child status changed when a guardian attempted to gain some form of profit from the child's labor, and that such an analysis is essential to understanding Nigeria's economic history. At the core of this book is the argument that child trafficking, child slavery, and other forms of coarse labor persisted beyond the 19th century anti-slavery movements because children functioned as trans pardon me, children functioned as transmitters of wealth through which Nigerians negotiated their social and economic position. Exploring the modality of children's labor and the porosity of their subject, subjugated statuses allows historians of Nigeria, slavery and children in childhood to reimagine the importance of placing children front and center in colonial histories. <clears throat> Pardon me, I'm jumping ahead. <laughs> International groups and humanitarians whose purpose it is to end human trafficking will benefit from historical research that exposes the social and economic underpinnings that in initiated trafficking and allow it to continue. However, the broad consens consensus given to the declaration that prompted legal practitioners, social scientists, and human rights activists focused on Nigeria to reframe, human to reframe human trafficking as new slavery or modern day slavery remains problematic when it is assumed that contemporary slavery re-emerged directly from the transatlantic slave trade. It is crucial that scholars and humanitarians recognize that slavery in all of its various forms has evolved over time, yet, there existed neither a pause in re-engagement in slaving practices from 200 years ago to today, nor an absolute reconfiguration of practices stemming from the same historical moment. The movement of bodies and the use of, and the use of labor has always depended on immediate economic, social, and political circumstances, as well as the reiteration and application of force and control over human bodies. It is only in this nuanced manner that we can truly understand the persistence of slavery as it relates to child trafficking in Southeastern Nigeria today and why the women's war was waged. 
So thank you for your time. And I suppose now we can move to Q&A. There you are. <laughs> and thank you for your patience with this technical glitch. Um, I suppose it could have been worse. So here we are. I think you were just fine, Robin. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful, elegant um, pricey of the book, but also um, sort of taking us into all of the core issues. So um, I'm going to facilitate the questions and discussion um, right now. So if you have a question for Dr. Chapdelin, please use um, the, the Zoom reactions function to raise your hand and that'll let me keep track of everyone. And, um, and we'll ideally open up for, um, for discussion for 15 or 20 minutes now. Just as a, as a heads up, what I may do, depending on how the pace of things goes, is to collect a few questions and then allow Robin to respond to, to numerous ones. But, um, but we'll just sort of see how, how we do. So um, open for questions at present. Please raise your hand if you have one. Presently, I see one from um, Mr. Bell, Rudy Bell. Go ahead. Uh, hi, Robin. Good to see you after all this time. Hi, uh, Rudy. I just have a, a very old fashioned historian's question, and that's about where your sources are located, in particular, the um, oral interviews that you mentioned. And I assume they must be transcripts of some kind. So just tell us a little more about the circumstances under which they were taken? Are they court testimonies? Are they sure. historians nosing around? What? T tell me more. Sure. So um, I visited archives both um, in Nigeria and the UK. I also did uh, interviews here in the US. I was in Nigeria to conduct interviews with individuals living in the Southeast during 19, 1999, um, 2011-2012. But there was an uprising while I was there about the oil issues. Um, the president, the then president rescinded the oil subsidies and Rutgers told me to get out as soon as I could. So I actually had to commission some of my interviews, but in, in, in that, those interviews came from the four provinces at the beginning, um, in, at the, as I noted in the map at the beginning. Um, but the archival, information that I have access to, mainly from the Nigerian archives at Calabar, Enugu, um, and Ibadan, are so rich with all of these stories, um, all of these trafficking stories. You know, in my book, you, I was able to detail specific routes of the child trafficking in the 1920s and 1930s, and how they greatly mirrored the same roads and paths as the transatlantic slave trade paths because of the predominance of Arrow slave traders and their settlements throughout the East. Um, so the archival materials, in addition to the oral testimonies, really were just um, filled with good, interesting information. Um, I have the transcripts of all of my interviews that were done for me. Some of them were done in English. Some of them were done in Igbo and they were tr transcribed for me. Um, a good number of them were both audio recorded and video recorded. Um, and they, they just produced so much information. That's where some of my art other published articles came from about different topics, but also about children and guardianship and migration. Thank you for your question. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And I know we have a fair number of undergraduates in the audience as well from a number of different classes and programs. So we'd really be eager to hear any questions that you have, um, particularly about, um, about how Dr. Chapdelaine got into her research perhaps, or how this fits into any of your own concerns about modern issues. So please feel free um, for those of you who are here to, um, to engage as well. Before all the Africanist historians just jump in and take over. <laughs> Um, from Grace Kinsinger and then Laura Lovett, we'll have you go next. 
Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. I was really interested in your comment about the, the terminology or analytical approach to modern day slavery and how it essentially assumes that it's an extension of the transatlantic slave trade. Do you see other analytical issues with focusing on modern day slavery as like being connected to past practices? And is this something that you've seen in other geographic contexts as well, or, or just in this case in particular? Um, I think generally, yes, um, two things. Number one, the book, my book's title uses the phrase or term child trafficking. That is a catch-all phrase I've used for the book um, in terms of, getting it out there, you know, there are children moving and why and how are they moving. But those of us who work on human trafficking, we know that human trafficking has a very specific definition, as does smuggling, as does sex slavery, modern day slavery, etc. Um, and that's detailed in the book. With regards to modern day slavery specifically, we know that it has been overused. It has been especially overused during this our, our political moment that we have just gone through and continue to go through. Um, and it's highly problematic because as it relates to the movement of children in Nigeria, often cultural practices are not considered. Um, the reason by the reason children move often do have to do, often have to do with their economic positionality. Um, and their economic survival strategies that the parents are employing or deploying um, for the purpose of maintaining and providing for the remaining children. And in almost every global society, um, those societies which are poor or you know, families which are poor, it is not unusual for one child to be removed from a household and set in another space where they're taken care of. So Nigeria is not unique in that sense. But a lot of times as it relates to Africa, one might say modern day slavery is happening because you know, there's a child working on a farm or there's a child that's gone to a different region of the country for a period of time to, to work under particular labor conditions. Um, and yes, that's very problematic and can be highly problematic in many instances. But I think that a lot of pundits or, or individuals that critique child labor are almost a little too quick to critique before understanding the cultural conditions on the ground. Thanks, thanks so, much. so much. That's really helpful. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much, Robin. That was a really nuanced way to, to characterize it. Um, Laura Lovett, go ahead. In some ways you kind of answered my question because I was thinking about the fact that children get loaned around all the time, especially in the depression, especially in the US, right? There, there's no sort of, we have this, this conception of kind of families and, can, and nuclear ideas of kind of the family and the way in which that's connecting. And yet we find in history, children are much more kind of a, a network connected um, individual. And so I'm wondering, I was wondering if, your work on the history of children in Nigeria kind of opens up another way for us to think about children broadly and the history of childhood especially. Yeah. I think the, the easiest way, or perhaps I should say the most poignant way to answer that is think about the value of the child in the home. And it is pr precisely because that child is value, valued um, and children, precisely because children are valued generally, that the child is given out. A lot of times with the hope, not only to receive something, um, some monetary value or labor value in return, but because it will, through, or the child's labor in some way, will basically save the family economically. Um, it, with pawning in particular, it is because you value the child so much that you are destined, you, you, your life's goal is to pay off that debt and receive back the child. Um, and then more, more broadly in terms of kinship systems, if we think about the ways that dependencies work um, in our immediate families and also extended families, um, 
it is almost necessary to have those safety nets in place whenever a family does come into some kind of economic crisis. Um, thereby, no matter where the location is, it almost seems natural to say, well, of course, the family would come and assist in some way, but it, it's not natural for us nowadays to think, well, the next natural thing to follow that would be for the child to go to somewhere else for care or whatnot. Now, I think the, the problem that arises is that our promise is kept once the child ends up into that secondary location, right? So in my research, the exchange is, okay, well, if I accept your child as a pawn, yes, he or she will work for me, um, but of course I'm gonna still give them an education and they're going to be treated like other boys and girls in the family. And uh, nearly all the dependent, all of my um, interviewees for this study said, yes, my family received pawns or I knew of pawns or my, my father's second wife was a pawn that he married. Um, and all of these pawn children and, and young women were treated the same in my family, but other people treated them poorly. Other people treated them like slaves. Other people didn't send them to school. Um, and I think we can see that globally too, whether or not the child or young girl is a pawn is a, a different issue, but these outside children coming in um, could often be set, um, treated rather as second-class citizens. And that, that's the unfortunate part. I see we have a question from um, Damalola Adebayo. Um, thank you very much for the talk. I, I wish I had read the book before attending this. Perhaps some of my questions would not be necessary. But I've got um, one or two questions and then a third one, which is kind of uh, selfish uh, for my own research, which is something I've touched on a long time ago. And I guess I'll start with that one. <laughs> and I was wondering whether the ILO, the International Labour Organization's uh, 1930 first labor convention, uh, whether it had any impact on the ground uh, in southeastern Nigeria with regards to uh, colonial policies towards pawning. Because I know that uh, at least in the records of the ILO, uh, they domesticated, quote unquote, I mean, domesticated the policy on the ground. Uh, so, but I'm not sure whether that was your experience from your own research. So <clears throat> that's the first question. Then uh, the second is more of, okay, let, let me also take a simpler one. It's on the title, right? The Persistence of Slavery. Mm -hmm. And I must, I'm writing a monograph, so I do know that uh, publishers probably have influence on titles and all of those things. But I am kind of concerned that, are you arguing that it, this is a story of continuity from uh, the transatlantic slave period? If yes, then uh, I'm sure you know that pawns existed as a, pawning existed as a separate category, even during the transatlantic slave trade period. So how would you then uh, look at pawning uh, through the high of the 21st century, as it were, or late 20th century, and then argue that they are slaves? And if you're going to make that argument, then I guess maybe the title should probably be the transformation of slavery as opposed to persistence. Uh, I'm not sure whether that uh, makes sense, but I guess I would just stop there for now. Uh, I, I don't want to ask too many questions. No, thank you for your questions. They're, they're rather great questions and important um, thoughts. Um, with regards to the title of the book, um, yes, there is some say in what the publisher does in terms of approving a title. Um, but I think that what you what you want to know is, do I think that pawning in its original def definition or the most um, uh, appropriate de definition, am I implying that number one, pawns were the same as slaves or that 
there is this continuation of pawning. Um, well, I'm not, I'm, I'm, maybe I don't understand the second part of, of what you said, but I clearly understand that the Atlantic trading systems, and I'm not just talking about the slave trading systems, but all throughout the Bight of Benin, Bight of Biafra, uh, Bight of Biafra and other areas in West Africa was based um, largely on pawning, um, depending on the region. I understand that, you know, local leaders and, and trade um, uh, in terms of hierarchies, I'm thinking of the house systems in the Delta, right? They used pawns to ensure that uh, they could get goods in a timely manner, transferred to boats, et cetera. Um, there's no argument that that was a pre-colonial system of money lending. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not arguing that certain systems of slavery persisted from the pre-colonial era to the post-colonial era. I'm actually arguing that transformations of slavery, as you did note, did persist. Um, but I think that I think that your comment is well taken in the sense that in in a direct translation, perhaps transformation would have been better. Um, but hopefully, my explanation to you about what I understand and know about the slave trade and what I understand and know about punning and what I know and understand about more modern form forms of enslavement um, are quite different. And I think that um, it is documented in the book. Um, and so that note is taken. In terms of the ILO, there was absolutely an impact of the um, work being done with regards to end pawning, right? And it wasn't just in Nigeria, it was in India, it was in China. There was a, lo there was a lot of places um, in the global arena where international um, activists were working to get, especially children and women out of these subordinate positions. I think where it comes up, and this is a sneak preview of my next book project, is really in the Southeast, um, from the issues with Liberia and what was happening to recruitment and the migration to Fernando Po and the ILO checked that and Liberia said, we don't want it anymore. We don't want um, Southeastern Nigeria labor recruiters, British labor recruiters or Spanish labor recruiters here tricking our men to go and work in um, the island South of Nigeria. But what ends up happening is they begin be, begin recruiting in the Southeast in Nigeria. So the problem shifted. Um, there was still an issue with pawning um, that didn't completely stop. Even during the fifties and sixties, we still see evidence of that, but there is definitely a legacy of the ILO's attention in Liberia, especially as it relates to pawning and then in Nigeria. Does that answer your questions? Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, if I can add a quick one, if, <laughs> People don't mind. Uh, uh, it's, it's. I am also keen to. Know, if this question isn't has already been answered by your book, please just refer me to the book. Right, I should have read it before coming. Um, <laughs> so, uh, do you have the numbers for for like the pawns that were like? I'm intrigued by the sources you mentioned, especially the ones where uh, you said uh, is it the reports of the colonial government where women had to like do like do detailed reports and where they discussed the uh, children being pawned and other socioeconomic issues? Do you have the numbers? Like, are they like? statistically significant in a sense obviously numbers don't necessarily mean impact but at the same time it would be uh lovely to see the numbers uh and more or less compare them within the context of the 20th century uh anti-slavery system to perhaps if possible uh transatlantic slave trade numbers mm -hmm. um the numbers that I have for pawning are not st st statistically significant, and there are two reasons for that. Um, number one, because my focus are in children, children are almost invisible when it comes to their movement. Mm -hmm. 
and the ability to identify child traffickers when there are so many men, women, and other children participating in that trafficking, covering that trafficking, um, that was almost impossible. And that is something I had to concede at the beginning of the book that it's impossible to enumerate these numbers. It is only through the testimonies that we get a sense that there were increased numbers of pawning and that in fact, pre-colonial norms of child pawning had been exacerbate, exacerbated during the colonial period because of colonial taxation. Even child slavery numbers, children who were enslaved um, in an indigenous manner were very low. And the way that I explain it in the book is for the exact same re reason. The porosity between being a free child, being a pawned child or an enslaved child or child bride um, was almost impossible to detect. Um, and so it is something that I really wish that we had. There are what 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 is statistically available, and this is what gives me faith that what I'm arguing is correct, is the number of debt cases wow. in the courts that increased during the 1920s. And what's happened is people have begun pawning their kids, men, have, men are being taxed, and instead of paying their taxes or even pawning the remaining children, people are choosing just to go to jail because resources, including human children, were becoming few and far between. Cool. Thank you so much, Robin. Um, we have time, I think, for one more question. Thanks. Uh, Judith Byfield, go ahead. Hi, thank you so much. Hey, Robin. Hi, Judy. <laughs> I just want to give you all a big hug. I miss you guys. <laughs> uh, oh, man. Yeah, we miss you too. Let me tell you, but I'm so glad the book is out now. Um, one of the things I was curious about too, so um, is, you know, the war comes in and has a really, World War II has a really significant impact on this region as well. And I'm wondering, you know, given um, particularly the economic demands that were being made on households, you know, production of um, palm oil, um, palm kernels, everything else around the war effort, mm -hmm. um, what impact that may have had on child labor more broadly, but also specifically on pawn ship. That is um, a great question. And what we found is that um, my research, I have a case study and that's how I can answer it, um, which is the Calabar Romand home during the 1950s into the early 60s. And the, the number of displaced children or those who are considered in need of care mm -hmm. um, those, those children were placed in this remand home, right? Sometimes at no part of the fault of their own, they weren't doing anything illegal. Maybe their parents let them travel with the trader as an apprentice or whatnot. Mm -hmm. And there was a social welfare officer named Margaret Belcher who was going collecting all these children in creeks and rivers and in canoe boats in the middle of the night because the British social welfare office, which mirrored a lot of other practices throughout the globe, right? About socializing children, limiting, delinquent behaviors, um, placing them in this romantic home. And what they ended up doing, and I think this is one way to answer your question about the war. Um, in the aftermath of the war, in many places, agricultural reform was required because of the decreased access to food um, as a direct result of the war. Mm -hmm. So all of these new farming techno technologies were coming to the fore and they were teaching the children in these remand homes. Mm -hmm. So they had this built-in labor, labor force, which was specifically made to build up empire right at the moment when it was about to collapse. Um, so in, in, in the article that I, I published in the Economical Journal Bulletin, um, I argue that these children were really in a, 
in a liminal space in terms of their labor where indigenous use of it was forbidden and it was negative and it, it, it was um, rife with stigma. But in terms mm -hmm. of the colonial regime, which is not very different from other things that other people have argued as it relates to children, mm -hmm. um, but it was unique because the, the colonial state was desperate for labor, mm -hmm. agricultural labor, and bodies to train other people throughout the colony so that they hoped that once these children got retrieved, which many of them didn't, but they would be their little, you know, little armies of, of agriculture or teachers um, throughout. Um, so in that way, that's how children functioned uh, in terms of labor. But many of these children also had been pawned mm -hmm. and landed in some kind of insecure system um, and had not been redeemed. So, you know, it is not unreasonable to, to guess that these children just had been pawned as a result of the prevailing economic conditions. Yeah. And, and really, I think, Judy, you, you'll understand the loss of land, uh, the continued loss of land um, and people's inability to farm their own regions, right? Right. So that was important. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much, Robin. This has been so fascinating to, to listen in on and to think about how we teach and what we're working on and whose stories we center and, and how they operate. Um, and I'm so grateful to you for your research. Um, I'm gonna take the kind of organizer's priority and ask one final question, but it's not a research question. It's a, it's a sort of broad opening up question for um, particularly for the undergraduates who are with us today, um, which is from your perspective as somebody who's really trying to and working to um, integrate historical research into modern conversations about um, about major social issues, human rights issues, and and so on. What do you think are the kind of cutting edges of work that's to come? Um, and and so I guess I'm I'm saying like if somebody were interested in learning more or in developing uh, work around issues of um, children and their labor, around their status, around sort of understanding the role that, that children play in, um, in, uh, as members of economies. What do you think they should be studying or interested in or pursuing? Like, what's the research horizon for us that some of our students might be able to, to reach someday? I think that a very black and white way of discussing it is to understand that or I would argue that no history can be written unless you understand children's economic and social positioning in society. So as that is, is that as the frame, you can almost do anything. Um, I would also say, you know, just kudos to my publisher. They have a great children's series that is, you know, publishing more books on, on children, that's a great place to start also. <laughs> Laura, if I could kind of shout out um, to University of Massachusetts uh, Press. Um, but generally, it's, it's still a growing field, right? We have organizations and journals popping up and um, the AHA just, you know, last year and then again in the fall had this exchange about the history of, you know, what is a child, what is childhood, but then again in the fall, which I participated in, um, how do we write about children? Can children be written about? So history as a discipline is really continuing to embrace this subset, this sub-discipline, um, and often defined as, as a shoot off of women's and gender history, but children as historical agents are really important to study. Um, and don't underestimate the sources that are out there. I would have never, I, I told one of my dissertation advisors, which the book is born from, as I was doing research, I kept saying, I'm not gonna do an economic history. I'm not gonna do an economic history. Um, I'm going to do a childhood history. And I found out I was doing an economic history with children as the informants. And one of my chapters has a whole thing on currency and you know, the introduction of the British pound, British pound, et cetera, but I didn't wanna, that's kind of one of those drier chapters, right? So I had to do an economic history and I had to figure, figure out how children fit in. Um, so I'd say don't underestimate the histories that are out there, uh, the evidence for those histories, um, and that children aren't just passive 
non-agentic individuals to study. So. I, absolutely. And I think particularly because some of our students are sort of moving from a status of child to a status of adult actively as we are teaching them about these things, right, legally, formally in their worlds. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I think that's also, it's a particular moment to think about sort of what does it mean to tell the stories of um, all of the, the these individuals who are contributing to economies and contributing to their families' livelihoods and, and doing this work all around us all the time. So um, thank you so, so very much. We're just so grateful to have gotten to hear about your work. I'm going to um, put a link into the chat so you can buy Robin's book because it's a great <laughs> book and I think everybody should buy it. Um, and uh, I think you'll also see that um, Anna Maria and Drew have provided a QR code for those of you who needed that. Um, uh, just as a reminder, we're going to have another, um, the second installment um, in our Critical Research on Africa series will be in April. Um, Dr. Obachuka Williams from Creighton University will be talking about um, childbirth and healing and, um, and, a, and a sort of medical history in Nigeria. We have two Nigerianists this semester kind of accidentally, but we're really thrilled about it. Um, and if you have any questions, um, you can register for the African Studies uh, mailing list and always reach out to any of the faculty who are interested in working on Africa to learn more. So Robin, thank you once again for a wonderful talk. We're thrilled for you for your book's arrival and we look forward to wonderful work in the future. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. Hi, Anne. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> Hi, Robin. How are you? <laughs> You're looking good. <laughs> so. I, just, I just can't believe I saw so many familiar faces. I mean, Pitt really brought me out in style, Rutgers style. <laughs> gotta, gotta. <laughs> I love that. I love that. It's good to see you. It's wonderful to see you. And I learned a ton today. So oh, that was fun. Excellent. Glad to hear it. Hopefully, we'll see you soon. Hope so. Okay. Wonderful. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm just so glad that um, I was able, I, I actually, I know I'm not really that worried about it because I know these things happen, but I don't know what happened when my screen just went blank. <laughs> it was it's, it's, most... like, it, it's like there are gremlins in our systems and we do not have control of the gremlin sometimes. I was listening to the wind blow and thinking, oh man, don't knock the internet out today, Pittsburgh wind, like. In, well, no, yeah, my electricity was crazy. Go completely off. But yeah. maybe that there was a, a hiccup, it, that's never even happened during a class. Um, so I wasn't quite sure what had happened. My screen just went black and I had yeah. to think, oh okay, my God. you can handle this. You, yes, no, it, was totally fine. it was totally fine. And, you know, and, and Drew actually, I don't know if you could hear him, but Drew immediately said, it looks like we've had a technical difficulty. Give us just a moment. And I was just like, everyone, please be patient. And we're used to it. I mean, <laughs> like, I, I think about um, the different kinds of glitches that I have seen in the last six to 12 months, and mm -hmm. some of which were like terminal, terminal failures. Oh, right. And, and we're all, we all understand that this is a weird situation that none of us have really signed up for and, and <laughs> technology changes over time. Yeah. Such that features you might've been used to, you're no longer used to. And it was wonderful. Right. And your slides came through beautifully for me and I could hear you clearly the whole time. And it was just a really great overview of the research and what brought you into it. I think it was super compelling. Really, Excellent. it's really great. I'm so Excellent. excited. Hopefully, Drew, you can splice the two sections together without too much. Yeah. Uh, without too, without too much. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah, it'll be good. Don't worry. It was awesome. It'll be great. It'll be great. Hello, Tema. It is so good to see you. Wonderful to see you. It's really good work. It's amazing to see where you've gone and what you've done. Thank you. You're so courageous. You've always been incredibly courageous and, and you know, um, balanced in your courage so it's great it's been an effort and as i told michael addis who sent me a message i said well you know i have to 